And hi, so um, welcome to the uh, Epidoc uh, tutorials series. Um, you can see the link below to uh, a list of all the tutorials that we have available in this series. In this particular session, um, we're um, going to be talking, Irene, Irene is going to be talking about the um, Epidoc edition structure, that is to say, the uh, where in a TIXML file Epidoc recommends you put each part of an epigraphic or papyrological edition. Um, so go ahead, Irene. Thank you. Uh, so when you uh, are starting working on uh, Epidoc files, you probably won't uh, be creating uh, a new file from scratch, but you will uh, go to this link to the guidelines and uh, download the Epidoc template, which is provided. And so if you go here, uh, you can see here a link to the template that you can download and then rename for uh, working on it with the Oxygen or another XML editor. Uh, and now we are going to see how this template uh, is structured and in which section, which parts of the template you use for, for what purpose. And here in this page, uh, we have our reproduction of the template. So let's have a, a quickly a look of it, at it. And, uh, we see here that we have a TI element, which is our root element, which includes everything. It starts at the beginning of the file at, and it ends here at the end of it. And then we have three main elements, which include, include a lot of other elements. And the first one is the TI header, which starts here and then here. Uh, which includes most of the historical and descriptive uh, data of the of the inscription. Then we have a facsimile element, uh, which um, which we use for links to uh, photographs or other images. And then we have the text, uh, the text which includes a body element inside which we insert all the rest. So that is uh, the text, the ancient text, the apparatus, translations, commentary, and bibliography, and. And uh, let's, let's now go back to the slides. So we have seen that we have the TI element, which is the root element, including everything. The TI header for the descriptive and historical data, facsimile, uh, which uh, could also um, be omitted, if not necessary, for the images, and the text. So for text apparatus, translations, commentary, and bibliography. And now we are going to focus on the text part of the edition. Uh, inside which uh, um, each of the parts that can be included um, should be inside a div element having a type attribute. And uh, uh, the values of type are fixed, are constrained. So uh, the values that uh, are allowed for uh, type attribute of div inside the text element are uh, the ones uh, which are shown in this slide. So for the addition of the text, we use div type addition. And if the addition, if the text is divided into uh, two or more uh, text parts, uh, uh, the div type addition could include um, other div type with value text part, one for each of the text parts. And then for the apparatus, of course, there is a div type uh, apparatus. And uh, the other values, as you can see, are pretty uh, straightforward. So the value is translation for translations, uh, commentary for commentary, and bibliography for bibliography. And uh, this is how they are um, displayed, are presented in um, the XML file. So we have the text surrounding uh, everything. Then we have a body element. And inside the body, um, in the PDOC template, uh, those divs are presented in this order, which is not constrained, so uh, the, it, it could be changed. Uh, but this is the probably most logical way to, to well, it, it will be probably more logical to have the text first and then the apparatus, but you can also have the text and then the translations and then the apparatus. Uh, you can have the bibliography by, before the edition if you prefer so, uh, because uh, in what it is in the XML file, uh, won't necessarily correspond um, to how this is this will be displayed uh, after the XSLT transformation. But if you take the um, XML epidoc template as it is, you will find these divs in this order. And uh, 
Let's examine the first uh, of those. So the div type edition, uh, as we said, is for the ancient text of the document that you are editing. So an, an inscription, uh, papyrus, or whatever other uh, type of ancient document. And in this, uh, you will see that um, besides the type attribute with value addition, uh, we also have always an XML lang attribute, uh, um, whose value in this example is uh, Greek, uh, uh, GRC for Greek, uh, but other values uh, could be provided for uh, inscriptions which are in other languages. And uh, this is uh, always required unless uh, your inscription is, or other text is divided in more text parts and the language is provided in each div type text part. Otherwise, you have to put it here in the div type edition. And uh, then all the uh, epigraphical, topological, topological text should be included in another element, which uh, usually is AB, standing for anonymous block. Uh, but in some peculiar cases, you uh, may need to use uh, line group, LG line group, instead of the AB, or P for, for paragraph uh, in other cases. And in, inside those elements, AB or LG or uh, P, uh, your text will be divided in lines, usually, uh, which are empty elements. So uh, you can see in the examples, we have put three lines. We have three A, B, uh, number one, two, and three, and, and so on. And of course, if it is a metrical text uh, inside the line group, you will have also the L uh, metrical line element, but um, you will find more information on this in another video. And uh, inside the text, uh, all the Leiden uh, signs should be represented by uh, using the uh, epidoc elements, so the gaps, uh, the, the bucket, uh, the, the integration, so everything should be, also all the Leiden symbols, so square brackets, round brackets, should be replaced by specific epidoc elements. And as we have said, uh, if a text is divided in more text parts, uh, every div type edition uh, will include, will uh, have nested inside uh, itself uh, two or more div type text parts. And as for the text parts, uh, we can see from these slides that, uh, this slide that uh, we uh, usually have a subtype uh, attribute. Uh, specifying what type of text part we have. And in this case, the, the value uh, is not constrained. So uh, here we have uh, some uh, examples, uh, suggested examples, which could be fragment or column or face, but you can provide here whatever value is uh, relevant to, to your document. And also uh, it's uh, very useful to have also a number, an N um, attribute, uh, saying uh, what is the name of this text part. So it could be one, two, first, second, but also A, B. It should not be necessary a number. It's a name that you give to the different text parts to distinguish um, them. And again, um, we have another element inside the div, which in this slide is A, B, but could also have been line group or paragraph. Uh, and if you have so um, two or more text parts, the AB element is inside the div type text part, so not just um, after the, the addition, the div type addition. And uh, let's look now at the apparatus. So here uh, we have a div type apparatus uh, inside which we usually have a list up element, uh, including a list of up elements, uh, one for each uh, apparatus entry. And uh, the div type apparatus derives from the TI app module, which uh, was designed originally for the Lachmanian apparatus criticus, which is used for literary text. Uh, and so it was main, meant mainly for uh, recording multiple uh, witnesses of, of a manuscript script or a document, uh, and this, is, this has been adapted uh, in Epidoc to the epigraphic um, apparat kind of uh, apparatus. So um, the div type apparatus in Epidoc uh, um, is also for um, commenting, uh, for comments on letter forms or considerations about uh, different restorations, uh, uh, interpretations of things that have not been restored in the text, or recording um, different uh, um, in, 
uh, editorial choices of uh, previous editors, for example, something that is very uh, often in epigraphic apparatuses. Then uh, we have a div type translation uh, in which uh, we have essentially the same rules uh, as for edition, for the div type edition, um, except that here uh, the, we will probably have a much, uh, uh, much uh, less markup than in the edition. So uh, we won't provide all the Leiden conventions that occur in the text. And we will have a probably a simple, simpler structure. Probably our translation won't be divided into lines. It will be continuous. And uh, probably uh, the, the expansion of abbreviation won't be present. So it will be silent. Uh, we won't have bra round brackets for it. And, but of course, if you want, you, you are allowed to provide in translations, in the transla one or more translations all the diacritics that occur in the text too, if useful, but usually we, we do not do, do this. And uh, so um, inside the div type translation, we uh, divide the text into one or more paragraphs. So we use the P element for this. And so we, we do not have the AB or LG or P or um, no, <laughs> AB or um, AB that we uh, have seen for the div type edition. And here again, uh, we can have uh, an XML lang attribute. And um, it is very useful if there are more than one uh, translation for stating which is the language of the translation. But of course, even if you translate just in one language, it's useful to state uh, which is the language that uh, you're uh, translating your inscription in. So um, in this case, it, it's English, uh, A-N, E-N, but you can also have uh, other values for, for all the other languages that you may want to use. And in div type translation, you can also have two other attributes, uh, which are RESP and source. And RESP is for stating the responsibility of the translation. So it is used for stating uh, who is the author of the translation among the editors of this uh, edition, this inscription. And source, so instead, it's used when the source of the translation is not directly one of the editors, but it is a bibliographic reference. So you can point to a publication from which you have taken this translation. And you may also want to use subtype in some cases to if you have a more kind of translation. So not translations in more languages, but um, different type of translations, you can state this in the subtype attributes. For example, you can say that it is a literal translation or a literary or pedagogical or whatever else. Uh, then we have the commentary. And here um, you can put everything you will put in a, in a common traditional commentary. So you can divide it in paragraphs again with a P element. And here you are allowed to uh, put your discussion about the inscription and um, with considerations about the, the, the dating of the inscription. Um, you can put external references uh, to uh, or internal references to other inscriptions of your uh, same project or links to other uh, external sources or uh, whatever you, you want. And you can quote text inside it. You can have some bits of uh, ancient text, ancient uh, um, inscriptions inside it, but it's probably, it probably will be mainly uh, prose about the, the inscription. And here, of course, you can provide a line-by-line -line commentary, not only general commentary about the inscription. Uh, and then we have the bibliography. And here you can see that um, all the bibliography uh, is included inside a list bib element. And each, uh, each bibliographic entry has its own Bible element. Uh, but this is not a constraining structure. In um, some cases, uh, other approaches can be used. And what it's important to, to know here is that uh, you can choose different approaches uh, to bibliography. So for example, you can have a div type bibliography inside your document. Uh, uh, listing uh, um, a freestanding bibliography, so a bibliography that won't be found uh, anywhere else in your project. But in some cases, you will probably have a master bibliography file elsewhere in your project, and you may want to, uh, to point uh, at this. So the div type bibliography could have a shortened list 
of a bibliographic entry is pointing to your master bibliography. Or in some cases, you may also uh, want to, to not include a div type bibliography, but uh, to point directly from uh, the various uh, bibliographic entries that you may have mentioned, for example, in the uh, commentary directly to an external uh, master bibliography. But um, in most cases, you will probably have a div type bibliography at least for listing the editions, uh, the main editions of your inscription, so you will probably always have it. And uh, again, also in this case, uh, you can have a subtype attribute uh, in which you could uh, say that this is a um, principal bibliography or it is derived from something else or it's a bibliography only for um, articles or um, publications that have discussion of this item without uh, having the edition or otherwise for only um, a bibliography uh, of editions, previous editions of this inscription. So, uh, but this is not necessary. So, just if you want to, to state it, otherwise you can have just a div type bibliography without uh, the, the subtype attribute. So, to sum up, uh, we have seen that uh, the AP doc template uh, has a TI element containing a TI header, a facsimile, and a text. And inside the text, uh, we can have um, six different types of div uh, type which fixed values, uh, constraint values, and uh, um, subtype uh, on the other hand um, can be used in some cases but its value is not constrained so it can be adapted to the project requirements and all the structure of the files uh, as regards to the text parts is completely free. So you can arrange your document or your inscriptions, your ancient documents in the way you prefer. But uh, in any case, it is always recommended to follow uh, precedents where possible. Uh, so um, you can keep the file as it is and look at other uh, database or edition, epidoc edition that have been done so far that you can find uh, online to, to check how a certain thing has been done so far. Of course, you can refer to the guidelines and to see their examples or how to structure the text parts uh, or other the other parts of the text that we have seen uh, now. And uh, I think this is all. So, Gabby, do you think, do you want to add anything on this? The only thing I'd add is that um, we've talked quite a lot about subtypes um, here, but you really only need to use the subtype attribute if you have multiple instances of the same typed division. Um, and, and if you do so regularly across your corpus and you want to be able to handle your, um, you know, one type of translation and another type of translation in different ways. So only then do you need subtypes. The, the majority of the time, we, we won't use the subtype attribute at all across the uh, across the divisions. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.